Hello, this week. If this, then what else? And also, what about vibes? But first, I'm Quinn Emmett, and this is Important Not Important, science for people who give a shit. You can hit subscribe right now to get this and my conversations with the world's smartest people every single week. You can find the email version and links to everything at importantnotimportant.com or right in your show notes. And now for today's big question. If Donald Trump is one of the worst people alive, a logical person would ask how the hell he got elected president in the first place and why, despite nearly 100 felony charges and losing his re-election bid, he swept the GOP primaries four years later already and is an extremely viable threat to regain the presidency. Now, look, the answers are myriad and complicated. But working from the bottom up, it's absolutely vital to remember that Trump was, is, the manifestation of all of the years of increasingly right-wing Republican talk. He is their stay-puffed marshmallow man. The same people that created him have been desperately trying to walk the return to the Middle Ages walk for a very long time. They were one infuriating John McCain thumbs down away from repealing Obamacare and have only become more the last duel was a rom-com ever since. And while you say that quiet thank you for John McCain and argue that the right wing has seemingly only been partially successful at the national level, of course, because young people, college-educated people, and of course, black women have salvaged some otherwise unwinnable races for Democrats, understand this. A decision like Dobbs, even one cast down from Trump's hand-picked Supreme Court, has much less of a practical effect in a world on women's health if those same right-wingers hadn't spent the past 20 years accumulating most of the governorships and state legislatures, and then using those to not only pass their own horrifically draconian state laws and refute Medicaid money, gleefully killing their poorest constituents, but also, simultaneously, it's all part of the plan, to gerrymander the national House of Representatives to within an inch of its life. In every single case, Every day, you have to understand that they have had a comprehensive plan all along and that it is still, in billionaire Jeff Bezos' words, day one. In the words of Dennis Green, and really like Liz Cheney and even Mitt Romney at this point, basically, they are who we thought they were. And you have to listen to people when they tell you who they are. And they keep doing that. So if destroying Obamacare, taking away health care, immigration, and uh, the wetlands were priorities if Trump, um, if Dobbs happened, if Mike Johnson happened, then what else? And what comes after that? This is what the 2024 election is all about. Now look, I'm going to hold you there. It's easy to sign up for this newsletter, audio feed, whatever you're doing, and think that I'm going to exclusively preach about the benefits of the next mRNA vaccines or brain implants or carbon removal, but you would be wrong. You and I are both excited about how well the HPV vaccine works. It's fucking incredible. And the incredible potential of a, a real-life malaria vaccine in Africa, gene therapy for kids who are deaf, uh, a nasal COVID vaccine, or even LFP batteries. But in the meantime, fucking measles is on the comeback not because of the science, but because of mass disinformation and consequently declining childhood vaccination rates everywhere. Measles. So sure, the sign on the door proudly says, science for people who give a shit. But here we are, talking about politics. Whether you're an ideologue, optimist, nihilist, pessimist, or doomer, whatever, nothing gets done here without a realistic understanding of how the world and politics actually works. And however much human and human traits and desires and wants remain the same, the world is quickly and increasingly working much less like it has for the past 80 or so years. Science matters. But for better or worse, its impact dramatically varies depending on who's in office and who's riding high on the S&P. For example, on the one hand, George W. Bush did PEPFAR. It is nearly impossible to undersell how important PEPFAR has been to the galaxy. On the other, George W. Bush set back crucial stem cell research for a very long time because pro-life. 
I would argue that PEPFAR is pro-life, but you know, what are you going to do? Look, you all said you want more global news and action steps, and we're doing that. And while more voters are voting across the world than ever before this year, I'm here to remind you that, for better or worse, what happens at every level of American politics affects the entire world, too. Maybe less so than usual, than before, but here we are. So yes, we're talking politics more directly today than usual, but I've said it before, and I'll say it again. We are biased here, but not towards any particular party, person, or company. Instead, we often and specifically call out both good actors and bad actors who are measurably working towards or preventing progress at every level of power. Understanding who, what money, and what policies are driving progress or standing in the fucking way are key to bending the arc further and faster. As author and Pulitzer-winning journalist Ed Yong recently put it to Julia Craven, one of our most sacred responsibilities as journalists is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Everyone talks about that. If you take that to heart, then often you're going to be interviewing people who are very vulnerable, who have been ignored, neglected, and marginalized. All of that can strip them of agency and a feeling of control in their lives. It isn't necessarily my job to restore that, although arguably that is part of comforting the afflicted, but I can do that. And I can do it in pretty simple ways that cost me nothing. And that doesn't violate any of the tenets of our job. Ed Yong is a fucking hero. Thankfully, however, I can go even further than this, because I am definitely not a journalist, though I obviously stand on the shoulders of the great ones like Ed to do this particular job. And this particular job, in my case, comforting the afflicted often means directly afflicting the comfortable, something that sparks enormous joy. I have written extensively and gone on the record to clarify that our job is to help you understand what's happening in the world by way of what's left of the very best, most reputable journalists, and then detail exactly what the hell you can do about it. So when I say we specifically call out both good actors and bad actors who are measurably working towards or preventing progress at every level of power, understand that for as sexy as fusion power or solar power desalination may be, progress very often means simply paid leave for hourly workers, heat protections for farm workers, Medicaid coverage for kids, and clean air in schools and office buildings. So often, what the hell you can do about it is to help improve the baseline the weakest links in our chain, among the most marginalized, by guaranteeing for many more people the absolute fundamentals. Clean air, clean water, healthy food, shelter, education, and healthcare. Maybe even a little uh, public transportation and access to nature while we're at it. So in the biggest global election year in modern history across the world, these are all why this contest between two really old people for president matters. It's why the Senate matters. It's why the House really matters. But in reality, because our federalist system is designed like Jenga from hell, so that one directly affects the other and then literally everything else, including Israeli hostages and Palestinian kids and coffee farmers in Uganda, it's why state and local races matter more than anything. It's not just because climate change is the heat you feel on your back and the saltwater intrusion into your local aquifers. It's also called reverse coattails. And our friends at Run for Something have some brand new research to back it up. New research by Blue Labs, commissioned by Run for Something and For Our Future, shows that Democrats contesting state legislative seats induces a meaningful increase in top of the ticket Democratic vote share. This is a phenomenon that we've referred to as reverse coattails. Essentially, it means that the folks running for state and local offices were responsible for increasing turnout for statewide or national candidates. Across states and cycles, we found an estimated 0.4% to 2.3% bump in top-of-ticket vote share when every local state legislator seat is within, within a precinct is challenged. So listen. Context. In 2020... Joe Biden beat Donald Trump 306 to 232 in the Electoral College. Wow. Joe even won the popular vote, 81,283,098 to 74,000,000 in Iowa. And he was the first candidate to get 80 million votes. But 
America doesn't choose presidents on a popular vote. And of the electoral college states that basically put Biden over the top, basically Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin, Dark Brandon actually won by less than 45,000 votes. In eight states, his margin was within three and a half points. So when run for something says we get a 0.4% to 2.3% bump in top of ticket vote share when we compete in every local and state seat, well, then it really fucking matters that we do that. Finding out what people really give a shit about when they say the vibes aren't great. And as I have written so much, the kitchen sink approach is the only one that works. Our candidates, campaigns, get out the vote and messaging must reflect that if we want more people to have more access to the things that will make them healthier and capable of inventing and pioneering and distributing really cool shit. We cannot simply win local races, though. We actually do have to defeat the worst person in America. And we cannot simply win Senate races. We have to take back the House so Mike Johnson doesn't get to turn America into a fascist religious fever dream. We can't just fund Planned Parenthood. We have to win state races to make sure Planned Parenthood can still actually operate in those states, and in many of them they can't now. We can't just invent new science. We have to advocate for it and fight for everyone to have access to it. Groundbreaking cancer drugs simply cannot cost a gazillion dollars, and people should not have to hide that they are sick at work. It's really self-defeating. If you disagree with me here, you're in the wrong place. Have a great day. Hey everyone, it's Quinn, your host and the founder of Important Not Important. I'd like to take a quick minute to tell you about the INI or any, whatever we're calling it these days, membership and community. It's a gathering place really for our most dedicated shit givers, a place to connect and learn from one another and to have access to me outside of the newsletter and this podcast. We started it last year, and it's grown to hundreds of shit givers from all kinds, from around the globe. I'm talking about teachers and investors, students, electricians, journalists, artists, scientists, and policymakers, and, and more. Members get exclusive access to our daily news homepage, which is very cool, and to much more top-of-mind weekly articles, research and tools that you can use and to stay ahead of the game, member sourced action steps, twice monthly book and culture recommendations that have nothing to do with the end of the world, virtual events, and of course the membership Slack channel. Look, so many people come to us asking, what can I do? And we think we do a pretty good job of answering that question and providing context for the answer. But the best answers and the best perspective really come from the community, a wide ranging community. And we would love for you to be a part of it, to feel supported yourself and to contribute to discussions and actions alike. And of course, by becoming a member, you're directly supporting our work here and ensuring that we get to keep doing it. So if you'd like to learn more, head to importantnotimportant.com. And if you're already a reader, you can just hit the upgrade button at the top. If you're not, Go ahead and subscribe for free, and you'll see the option to become a member at whatever level works best for you. And as always, you can always find the link to become a member right in your show notes. So thanks for listening, and as always, thanks for giving a shit. Back to the show. If we want the vibes to be better, guys to rein in regulatory capture in basically every arena, to guarantee clean air, water, healthy food, shelter, and health care. We have to walk the walk too, and chew gum at the same time, all of those metaphors. Let's talk now about how we measure vibes in 2024. By a lot of measures, the U.S. economy is completely out of control, in a good way, in a great way, even. We simply cannot stop adding jobs, it seems. Our late COVID recovery blows nearly every other wealthy country's recovery out of the water. Biden's shitty approval ratings are actually less shitty than nearly every other Western president or prime ministers. Old man Biden, it seems, is not really the problem in most cases. The horror show in Gaza, and to an extent immigration, being outliers here. But why then is the delta between economic measures 
and vibes so enormous. Now, on the one hand, it's important to dive into those various polls and understand that self-identified Republicans say the vibes are way worse than self-identified Democrats, which obviously skews the overall number. Fine. Sure. But I also don't really believe in scoffing at how people say it's going for them, especially when the world is changing so quickly and we, we are connected to world events more than ever before. We have to update how we measure things when the world is changing so quickly. Maybe the Delta keeps showing up in polls because we are trying to rate quality of life and success and vibes on an out-of-date system and measure. Here's a quick story. In January 2013, my wife's cult favorite network comedy, Ben and Kate, was canceled by Fox. This, one month after our first kid was born, and barely 13 episodes into what would have otherwise been a 23 to 25 episode season. I wrote this in my journal, and yeah, I keep a journal. Use day one. It's great. Here's what I wrote. Ben and Kate ended last night. I should say, Fox pulled it from the schedule earlier this week and officially canceled it yesterday, so last night was the last day of shooting in a series so dear to us and so many, so funny and full of heart, ended. It's just so sad. Dana, my wife, worked so hard to build a warm, supportive, successful show, and it really was all of that. These actors, none of whom even knew each other in April, were told to play a fake family. So they made it as real as they could, and just when they started to hit their stride, someone up top said, Stop. Because our numbers weren't good. And they weren't. It's the truth. But neither are anyone else's. And while we might have been lower on the totem pole, it's all relative, and there will never be traditional rating highs for single-camera comedies like those that Modern Family pulls these days, and even multi-cams are in trouble. So we're the sacrificial lamb, the last to go. And it's heartbreaking. What could have been? I wrote that a week after Obama started his second term, and months before the Senate passed comprehensive immigration reform, and the GOP House refused to even discuss it. Ben and Kate was canceled a week before House of Cards premiered on Netflix, heralding a new streaming future, and months before healthcare.gov crashed on arrival. Yet yeah, Donald Trump and Prime Video both technically existed that week, but there was no HBO Max, or Max, or Peacock, or Apple Plus. Insurrection and a nationwide right to gay marriage were pipe dreams. For my wife and TV in general, it was still too early into a future that was clearly coming soon for decision makers to risk their jobs on keeping her beloved little comedy on the air. And now, 12 years later, for everything, it's been an eternity. Premium cable has come and gone. Fox doesn't really exist anymore. And neither does journalism as a career or a business model. The Avengers and voters both turned out and then burned out on each other as studios bought back all the rights from Netflix to build up their own catalogs and their own streamers, fighting off Apple and Amazon and their unlimited cash in the process, absolutely hemorrhaging money on the whole project. And now, having added that up and after the strikes, they're back to selling their best shows to Netflix again, and it's Biden versus Trump round two, and we're still trying to measure vibes with the same tools and expectations. In TV, studios announce, cast, and shoot entire shows, and then remove them a year later so they don't have to pay residuals and rights fees. They're just gone. Movie studios announce, cast, and shoot entire movies and then don't even release them, valuing the tax write-off more than whatever meager revenues they might have gained, threatening then to use AI for everything, eventually driving the WGA and SAG to strike for half a year and actually rekindle the labor movement in America. It's all happening so fast, and it's happening live, and even the smartest among them basically have no idea what they're doing. Does that sound familiar? So yeah, Biden has been a mostly good president, providing stability and normalcy where there was none, and desperately trying to revitalize American labor and industry and around a climate change effort. But that latter stuff just takes time. Meanwhile, every day, we got two huge wars again, which might explode even more, Immigration problems everywhere, the, the energy transition, inflation, which turns out mostly to have been corporate gouging, uh, private equities buying and stripping down every sector in America, low unemployment, but it sure as hell feels like there's never enough bus drivers or nurses, 
primary doctors, electricians, teachers, etc. Unaffordable and inaccessible childcare and summer camps. Unaffordable and inaccessible preschool being watched all the time by companies and police departments and ring doorbells. Like COVID, everyone you know has been sick for months. Institutions have been deemed completely untrustworthy uh, or corrupt. California is underwater for the second year in a row, which would have sounded amazing five years ago, but now it's really bad and 90% of homeowners don't have flood insurance still. Meanwhile, rent is unaffordable for half of the nation's renters. So yeah, vibes matter, man. And contextually, it's helpful to know that right now across the world, live, they're similar. They're immediate. They're live. So while vibes show up in polls, freaking out pundits and campaign managers alike, only when we cast a vote are we actually presented with a meaningful, irrevocable decision. The single opportunity to actually choose the lesser of two weevils, as my mentor Jack Aubrey once preached. A poll commits you to nothing, but we should pay attention to it. A vote could lead to PEPFAR, or a child tax credit, or a national abortion ban. And this is why I'm so passionately in support of organizations like our friends at Environmental Voter Project, who focus on getting out would-be voters aligned with a single issue, the environment, not any particular candidate. They don't mention them. The math is simple. Messaged correctly, voters who really give a shit about something will figure out the right candidate to vote for. We just need them to vote. Sure, it helps to have an all-time antagonist, right? And especially one with an actual criminal track record, whose future actions are no longer simply theoretical, if no longer fresh in our mind because, uh, again, two new wars. But despite how evil that fucker is, and how cartoonishly terrifying Mike Johnson is, the name on the ballot is still only half the story. Donald and Mike are the freak show Franken-children of generations of GOP scheming that will never ever stop. Yeah, Trump's unique. He'll swing some voters again, especially rich ones who long for his tax cuts and who don't give a shit if your kid's school doesn't have enough bus drivers or clean air. And somewhat similarly, there are definitely people who will only vote for Biden or anyone younger, like Newsom, and not the other. But the vibes are what it's going to come down to. They really matter more than ever. And that's why messaging matters more than ever. For instance, if it's what gets the jobs done, talk about heat or pollution, not emissions or climate change. Fuck those things. We fear Trump because we fear the practical implications he's been tasked with and clearly capable of setting in motion. Fine. If he wants to pander to evangelists and take credit for Dobbs, great. But you need to remember this. Whatever he says, he was only partially responsible for Dobbs. All of the thousands of state legislators who were born ready to criminalize abortion are the ones who rushed to put it into effect. MAGA isn't some theory or set of values. It is an operational game plan that is still running at the state level. It is a partially operational Death Star. So if this, then what else? Do you want MAGA and everything it entails or not? That's what we're voting for. There's no halfway. Stay puffed, my man, didn't stop at 52nd Street. The fellas had to cross the streams, another irrevocable move, to stop him. You're tired of donating and voting. Mike Johnson is the tip of MAGA religious fundamentalism in America, and you have only glimpsed what they are capable of. Wetlands probably wasn't even on their list. If all this is what they'll say in public, what the hell are they saying in private? Here's one way to win and prevent the long defeat, as we've talked about before. Do what you're elected to do at every level, and tell people how you're doing it, and show them how it's affecting their everyday life and their vibes. Not an elected official, like most of you, your job is to help tell their story for them, to stand up and say how their actions have affected your life and your vibes. Look at it this way. Consider in 2022, the two places that suffered Democratic losses and consequently lost us the House were California and New York. If abortion won everywhere it was on the ballot, it basically has. You know where abortion wasn't on the ballot, wasn't under threat? That's right. And this is why it matters that we build and vote from the bottom up, but simultaneously don't ignore that Trump and Mike Johnson and everyone that comes after them will absolutely ban abortion and vaccines nationwide the minute we blow it in a California and New York, the minute they are able to. They have started with states, and they are taking advantage of momentary complacency and blue strongholds to go national. Top to bottom, bottom to top, 
This is what Hydra or MAGA or whatever has done for almost two decades, and it's why. Despite losing many of the most recent national elections, they still have so much power over so many people in so many places and so much potential to accrue even more. There has never been a better time to pick a side, and I hope in 2024 you'll choose the one that doesn't have Nazis. Here's your relevant action steps. Number one, donate to Voters of Tomorrow to defend democracy for the next generation. Number two, volunteer with Run for Something to help young, diverse progressives get elected. Three, get educated about how your country is keeping up with its commitments to the Paris Agreement using the Climate Action Tracker, and then hold your public officials accountable. Next one, be heard about returning potential power, political power to the people, and contact your representative to support the Democracy for All Amendment, and last, you can invest in sustainable companies with UTIL, U-T-I-L, using insights based on data, not greenwashing. That's it for this week. Again, it was a different one, but if you got feedback, questions, or opinions, email them in, questions at importantnotimportant.com. Please rate us five stars, hit subscribe to get next week's issue straight to your feed, and to go deeper, visit importantnotimportant.com. Thanks for being a part of our community, and thank you for giving a shit.